Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 705. That is 705 of the Agostino Zynga show and I hope you are doing well wherever this lovely little podcast may find you. I hope you are doing splendid. How am I? All good, all things considered, all good, all things considered. I cannot complain, I truly cannot. It's still been warm here in London, I'm sure in other parts of the UK. And, you know, it's unbearable as it is always, especially from working from home. But one of the other things that's made it even doubly unbearable is that the current building I'm in at the moment is going through some refurbishment because of the tragedy that happened in Greenfield Towers in South London, where unfortunately a whole tower block um, went up in flames and many, many, many people died. And most of it was due to the negligence of the local council, the building associations, um, and how they build the flat in terms of the um, cladding that was on the outside, which effectively meant as soon as one flat went up in flames, the whole entire block of flats went up in flames like a flipping candle. And it was really, really heartbreaking to see the amount of lives that were destroyed and lost um, through that tragedy. So because of that, the government received a lot of pushback, a lot of criticism, rightly, because of the lack of proper cladding in some of these um, blocks of flats, especially the ones that are in the more, let's say, less favourable parts of London, the ones that aren't, um, you know, in, inhabited by the by the rich and the upper classes and whatnot. So because of that, they wanted to put some things into place and to make sure that tragedy doesn't happen again. And they implemented these wide sweeping changes where they would essentially upgrade the cladding on most flats around London. Um, just to kind of get it all up to spec, all up to spec, sorry, so that tragedy at Greenfield won't happen again. So that's what they're doing currently now at the block of flats I'm living in. They're replacing all the old cladding with some new cladding. But unfortunately, the level that I'm on <laughs> is getting all the work and they are absolutely drilling the side of my building and it's really loud. So you're hearing the noise coming through when I'm on a flipping Zoom or a Slack meeting call. You know, I'm, I'm hearing my colleagues like straining their ears because of all the flipping banging, but it is what it is. And then on top of that, the house is also a flipping sauna. So it's like a double kabam of issues happening at the same time. We've got not only the weather has turned this flat into a literal sauna, we've also got non-stop banging from the builders outside trying to make sure that our house is livable and so we don't get any issues if ever there'll be a fire in here, God forbid. So it's been a little bit of a crazy one, I'm not going to lie, but I'm still thankful that I get to um, stay at home for the most part and don't have to travel in this heat on the train because I can't imagine what that'd be like. I think if I had to go and commute to work i probably would jump on my bike which i you know ride around a, a lot this, these last few days but i couldn't imagine having to jump back on a train and do the whole central line thing because i was really unlucky i never ever worked in places that are requiring me to take the overground or the elizabeth line which is now in place but mostly the overground i never had that pleasure the overground is usually street level so you always get some nice little you know um, ventilation coming through a nice little cool breeze when you're standing up in the shoes and, and i think if i'm not mistaken it also has air, air conditioning but maybe it just might be the cool breeze of it always opening because it's on street level but i always worked in places where i had to go underground victoria line bakerloo line which is one of the warmest lines jubilee line central line which is horrendous so those always 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 meant i'd have to go in peak times normal times between work eight, anywhere between 8 a.m and 10 a.m and i'm coming back in the peak times to anywhere between five and flipping seven so i'm thankful i work from home but of course the drilling on the side of my house is not been fun but hey you cannot complain Apart from that, there's been some small updates in football. May United, you know, there was a rumor flowing around that we're going to go and try and sign El Ghazi, who's a free agent from Aston Villa, um, a very mediocre player, to be honest. And I didn't really understand why. And then, of course, it transpired that he played in PSV Eidenhoven and that, you know, um, Eric Ten Hag is familiar with him. And then it stood up this whole another conversation around Eric Ten Hag's player identification model at the moment. It seems like whenever he doesn't get his first or second choice, he just goes back to a league that he knows and he goes back to the players he already played with other managers they go out of their way not to try and tap back into the pool of former players they coach they tr they kind of set themselves a challenge to find new players to find new stars but he doesn't seem to do that which is kind of understandable in some ways because of the leadership we have in our club right with the Glazers in charge and with the absolute donuts who are in charge of the football side of things in terms of John Murtagh and Darren Fletcher he probably doesn't trust them to get the players that he needs so he'd rather work people that he knows because he knows there's no other process in place because I think at the moment we might have the highest 
amount of scouts in any team in the league. I think they're in the hundreds or something, if I remember reading somewhere. But the issue that we have is not the scouts. We don't have a lack of scouts. We don't have a lack of player identification models or AI and shit. It's mostly to do with how those decisions get made. Once they make a short list of players, how does it then go from having a short list of players to actually getting these players signed? And that's where it just becomes long because there's so much red tape. There's so many middle managers. Everyone wants to get involved. They're afraid of spending money. Everything is commercial. And then that's when, you know, all those kind of chances go by the way. So I don't blame Eric Ten Hag for trying to take ownership and dip him back into his former player pool. But it's getting annoying because El Ghazi to be honest even though he's got experience playing in the premier league and i think he might be 28 29 or something and those along those kind of lines i don't think it's fair on a player like Facundo palestri who's been at the club for a long time has never got his chance and i think he's as good as el ghazi now i'd much rather take a chance playing for Kundo Pelestri then I'll do playing El Ghazi because at the end of the day when you're Eric Ten Hag you have to really look out for yourself you're the manager if you get it wrong you're the one going to get fired the players aren't going to get fired before you so if I was him some self-preservation I would just play the youth fuck it play the youth you're not going to get money from the Glazers they're not going to sanction wide sweeping changes in the club there's still this idea that we're going to get sold which probably isn't going to happen just play the youth and just hope and pray hope and pray with the youth and go from there and the fans will be on your side because fans love when the kids play they would give them a bit more grace than senior players and then you can have some respite and also you have young players who are way more malleable way more open to Chris no yeah way more open to instruction in that regard right you can actually mold them in the way that you want as opposed to all the senior players who maybe are a bit set in their ways but again what do i know when it comes to that stuff absolutely nada and also there's been happening new york fashion week it's been a bit of a hit and miss, I'm not going to lie. Um, there's not a lot of designers that I actually look forward to seeing in New York Fashion Week. Most of the um, designers I like to see are usually in London and, of course, Paris. But, of course, Paris is obviously the pinnacle in terms of an experience to go to and whatnot. But, you know, it's decent enough to see some of the U New York-specific um, people there. And I think because of the rising cost in living and maybe just transportation and getting things to different places there's been a more of an emphasis on american designers actually you know debuting their shows or showing in places like new york i feel like a lot of people were trying to go to london or new york or paris sorry because there were more eyes there there were more buyers there but now because of the restrictions being put in place they just can't afford to do showrooms or do shows abroad they'd rather do them at home so it's made i think the new york fashion week stronger if that makes any sense and um, i think it's only going to continue going forward as well so that's good to see but so far my standouts um obviously have been helmet lang i'm going to speak about later um there's also been who else i've liked laquan smith i've always been a big fan of him in you know in a very crass way of rec of that like, comparing laquan smith kind of to me is like a black tom ford i know it's a really crass way to compare people but that's the kind of appeal he gives to me but it's a little bit more sexy it's a little bit more fun um it's a little bit cooler right but it does give me that kind of chic grown-up um sophisticated you know rich kind of appeal to it right somebody that's just like uh, just cares about lifestyle the kind of person that goes out at night just wearing a silk shirt buttons undone no jacket a card holder no phone and just gonna go and vibe and take the night and let the night take them on a flipping journey that's what i love about laquan smith so he's been pretty good um who else have i liked um that's about it parenza parenza shula has been pretty decent as well saw bits and pieces of that i thought coach was pretty nice um coach i've had some weird i've had to, i've always had a weird um i've always had a weird vision of coach i guess because in my head i always think of coach as like michael Kors, that kind of level of a designer but it's started to you know they've started to improve their their output and they're clearly trying um to become cooler and they're doing a really good job i feel like the stuff that i saw in the runway for the most part is it's actually quite impressive but i can't just shake the kind of cheap vision in my head of what coach used to be but i guess now they're sort of slowly changing it anyways that's the stuff i've been kind of keeping an eye on but let's get on the show and let's not waste any time and let's just dive in on the topics that i've got for you today so number one topic to talk about is unfortunate news um for all of you mcqueen fans out there the one and only sarah burton is leaving alexander mcqueen after nearly two decades 20 years at mcqueen at the helm there um ever since um lee mcqueen unfortunately passed away she was been holding down the fort and now she is going to be stepping aside and allowing somebody 
they are new to come in. So this is the article courtesy of The Guardian. And it says as follows, um, Sarah Burton, the creative director of Alexander McQueen, who designed the Princess Wales wedding dress, is leaving the fashion house after more than two decades. In a statement released on Monday, carrying the brand's parent company, announced that it was its show on the 1st of September during Paris Fashion Week will be Burton's last. We would like to express immense gratitude to Sarah for writing such an important chapter in the history of Alexander McQueen. Um, how sorry um, Sarah's contribu contribution over the past 26 years will be an indemnable mark will leave an indemnable mark sorry and um, what's that word called what's that person called Gian Gianfilippo Gianfilippo Testa and Alexander McQueen chief executive Kering said Burton's successor would be announced in due course the Macclesfield born designer first joined the brand in 1996 as a permanent year um, on the placement year sorry while studying at St Martin's in London she returned after graduation just two years after in 2000 was named head women's designer after the death of the brand founder lee alexander mcqueen in 2010 she was named a successor and charged with continuing his legacy a year later burton shot to international fame when she revealed that she was designer behind the princess of wales wedding dress as you can see there in the picture at the time the, the clarence house said that they had chosen the british brand for the beauty of the craftsmanship burton described the process of creating the lace gown complete with an eight foot train as an experience of a lifetime she has remained the princess's designer of choice for events including a wedding at the duke of duchess of sussex in 2018 and a funeral funeral of queen elizabeth ii in 2022 in 2012 burton was awarded the order of the british empire obe for her services for the british fashion industry her departure was announced amid a broader reconstruction um, at caring which also owns gucci balenciaga saint laurent and bottega veneta McQueen, who founded the label in 1992, um, sold majority stake to the Gucci Group and now merged with Kering in 2001. The French conglomerate, founded by Francois Henri Benoit or Benou, how do you fucking say his name, is attempting a major transformation in order to revive sales as its star label Gucci, given a new direction of the luxury group in recent years, has lagged behind LVMH, its biggest rival, which owns Louis Vuitton. In November 2022, announced Angela McKelly was relinquishing his role as creative director, um, Sabato de Sano. His successor will make his debut of the brand next week during Milan Fashion Week, which would be fucking awesome. There's also a reshuffle in management level. This month, Marco Bizzari will step down as chief executive of Gucci, while the group has appointed more Green Chiquet or Coquette or Chiquet as a former um, chief executive of Chanel to its board of directors and named Francesca Bellettini as a chief executive at Saint Laurent and a head of the group portfolio brands. Last week it was revealed that Benoit or Benoit um, will take the controlling stake of the creative arts agency CAA, the Hollywood talent agency, which represents A list uh, um, actors including. Brad Pitt, Salma Hayek, and Penoir's wife. Um, Penoir acquired CAA for seven billion through the Penoir Family Investment Fund. Um, Artemis, which owns forty-two percent stake in Kering, the venture marks a new direction for Penoir, who spent most of his past decade building a forty billion dollar for profile portfolio. So, focus on luxury. So, first things first. It's amazing that Sarah Burton is going to get an actual amazing goodbye. I feel like, for whatever reason, I feel like. So obviously sometimes when designers are at houses and there's you know bad behavior involved there's fraud there's whatever then i understand where they do the whole immediate effect you know no big statement and they just let the person just kind of disappear into the shadows but i think when somebody's been at a house for as long as um um sarah burton has been at mcqueen you sort of deserve a good sending off and one of the things that kind of gutted me about the gucci story with alessandro michelli is that he never got that sign off i don't really know what that was about i always felt like he did a really good job at gucci yes towards the end it was getting a little bit you know a little bit stale it was getting a little bit repetitive and boring but i still felt like he did enough to bring gucci back into the cultural zeitgeist to make it a quote-unquote trendy brand once again and he deserved a good send-off which he never really got he kind of disappeared into the night um in between seasons didn't really get a send-off no flowers at the end of the runway no tears no nothing he just kind of showed his last collection and it was kind of over at least um Sarah Burton will get that um she's kind of a bit press shy really for the most part um, she doesn't see myself as going to really bask in all that attention but it's still nice to be acknowledged to have your flowers and um, for all the amazing work that you've done so I'm really glad that's going to be happening but another part of me is also thinking it's about time 20 years at a label um, or a house like McQueen is probably long enough um, if you want to be innovative if you want to be kind of forward thinking if you want to be fresh you kind of need fresh talent to kind of step into the fold and no better person as a fresh talent who's now free having recently stepped down from their role at Supreme 
get Tremaine Emery involved. <laughs> Make Tremaine Emery the head of Alexander McQueen, right, to bring it back into the modern 21st century. And then you'll see stuff change, right? Or you can maybe hire a flipping future, who's now the creative director of some capsule thing at Lamba, right? Get him involved. Um, who else is involved? Maybe you can get Yoon from Ambush. Maybe Yoon from Ambush can take over. Imagine, imagine how much Twitter, sorry, fashion Twitter would break down if someone like a Yoon Ambush got the job or if they gave the job to like, I don't know, Justin Saunders from Jound. Like imagine if they gave to one of those street people I'm thinking. It would, people would go absolutely crazy if they gave it to like Alex Olsen, right? Bianca Shandon, dude. Um, if they gave, <laughs> I'm trying to think of some street guys who could have it because Heron Preston can't take it now because he's obviously at H&M. But I wonder if, if they're going to go the streetwear route and try and get somebody who's kind of cool and in the know. Maybe they might try to tap fucking Mawalola or something, right? Or Mawalola, however you pronounce her name, I do apologize. Or another one is a good maybe in the addition here. They go the fashion route. And instead of trying to hire somebody within Sarah Burton's design team, you just go fresh and you kind of take a nod back to the legacy of Lee McQueen and you tap in some kids from fucking St. Martin's and you don't really have it be like a main person. You have it like be like a collective. So there's no real face to it. And you just start churning out the designs like that. Like how Margiela was after Margiela left and before what's his face? Um, John Galliano stepped in where it's sort of like a collective um, or even how it is now with Gucci, the Gucci studio, I saw it designing the runway collections. I'm sure they could do it. If you tapped in with some kids from St. Martin's um, on the, on the BA course, on the MA course, and you got them to be involved in it, that would be a pretty sick little role. And maybe every year you have one spot open for recent graduates to kind of join the design team. It'd make it really popping and it would turn London. And, and then again, you, you return the shows back to London. Like that would be fripping crazy. Like the Anthony McQueen shows back in London, London fashion week um you know spearheaded by a collective of of kids who recently graduated from flipping st martin's and shit or other fashion schools across the uk maybe you select like one from each of the best ones one from st martin's one from middlesex one from whatever right that would be fucking sick i'd fucking love that but it's like it's not gonna happen they're gonna probably pick someone within her team i'm assuming or maybe somebody that's in the um, behind the scenes that i'm not really too aware of maybe you have to be a little bit more balls deep in the industry to sort of know these people um but i would like to see something like that along those kind of lines because i know fashion twitter is going to be angry if they get someone from streetwear because you know fashion twitter people hate the streetwear guys even though the streetwear guys they sell a lot um they're clearly popular um and you know they clearly have a handle on the cultural zeitgeist got their finger on a button they're able to go viral all that good stuff that you know cheeky executives and board members like because it makes them money but i think artist because i think mcqueen you can't it can't just be fully a commerce thing it has to be some level of artistry and love and whatever else included so hopefully Hopefully we see that and they do end up hiring somebody that's probably fit for the role but again don't hold your breath because it took them a long time to make the change with um, Sarah Burton so I don't you know think they're gonna finally decide to make sweeping changes um big ones that I would like to see anyway um going forward now that she's sort of stepped away um there's a Vogue article here as well which says this was Sarah Burton's Alison McQueen as seen in Vogue we've got various pictures here of Sarah Burton's designed as pictured in Vogue magazine as I'm scrolling down you can see some excellent moments but like i said before i just think we do it does need a freshening it does need a new direction it does need a new voice and i think probably now is probably the best time considering the amount of talent that exists out there because i'm just thinking off the top of my head of people that don't have jobs or that would love to get the job there's probably people that already have brands now um you know debuting at fashion week and shit who would probably love to get this position also that might be a good way to kind of go in it like imagine if they gave it to um What's the bank? Who's the guy that I like? Charles Jeffrey. Lover boy. He could probably do something really good with this. Um the other designer, um what, what, the name, because uh, I when I when I scrolling down here, it kinda reminds me of it. Um is it Chipova? Cheap Shipova or something like that, right? I forgot how you pronounce the name. But that aesthetic may actually go well with the uh, McQueen also. So I'm just kind of thinking out of my arse here. Is it Chipova or Chipova? um yes yeah is it chipova Luena? is that the one yeah i think that might be the one that might be the brand again very out there choices don't kill me but i'm just trying to think out the box but you know sarah Burton did a good job um great job actually not even a good job she has a lasting legacy and i'm eager to see what the new direction is going to look like for her personally i wonder what that's like right you do a job for 20 years 20 plus years nearly 30 right 
um what do you do now do you just like chill and enjoy life with your family do you design in the background silently under a pseudonym or you know just anonymously like what do you actually do like in that regard i wonder what what the what that looks like because i feel like fashion is similar to like ufc and boxing and shit you don't really leave it at the top usually you get pushed out because you're stale and you run your course but when you do get to leave on your own terms you should probably leave with your head high and actually go out on a high and not try and come back and set up your own label and shit and just you know enjoy the memories you've had maybe drop a few pieces here and there but don't set up a whole brand that's just not worth it probably isn't worth it after 20 something years but who knows um we're eager to see what her next chapter is going to be like going forward so godspeed to sarah burton moving on from sarah burton out with the old and in with the new for lack of a better phrase we need to talk about peter doe at helmet lang so he debuted already at new york fashion week i really enjoyed the collection um i thought it was a really good debut it maybe didn't blow me away but i thought it set a good primer for what's to come it was a good way to kind of quote-unquote cleanse the palette and sort of allow him the space and the platform to tell his story via the platform of helmet lang some people on fashion twitter don't agree so i'm going to go through the timeline of events talk, read a little bit of the article that kind of you know um spoke about his introduction to helmet lang and his story so far that was featured in the new york times and then of course go through the collection and have some of my opinions you know included here and there so this is courtesy of new york times the article title is a fashion prodigy um makes a big debut no pressure peter Doe held up a pair of helmet lang jeans by their pockets pulling the pulling them against their waist against his waist sorry the denim was cut off it was off white splattered with a white paint and softened with age he had already reached out and filled the fabric pinching it between his fingers between my fingers sorry when mr doe said that he'd never washed them maybe that's the kind of gross of some people i'm just scared of destroying them 10 years ago he'd been bought um he'd bought them at a vintage store for about eight three hundred dollars he said and now he was shoving them off um in the helmet lad head he was showing them off in the helmet lad headquarters in the meatpacking district of manhattan Mr. Doe arrived at the company in May, fresh faced at 32 and ready to revive the brand as its creative director. Oof, imagine being the creative director of Helmet Lang at 30 fucking two. Fucking crazy, man. Um, he's definitely a prodigy. Um, it continues. Mr. Doe felt attached to the jeans in a way that people often do. Denim that simply fits very well. He wore them while interviewing for the job. And after he got it, he decided to recreate the long slim cut in his new collection. That's something everyone always does isn't it i remember when i would uh you know when you go to your adidas interview vans interview yeah i worked for quite a lot of footwear brands isn't it i worked for vans this is all retail vans adidas nike and that's it right vans adidas nike yeah but those are the main ones really and obviously dr martin's but i wouldn't call that would you call that a footwear brand or a shoe brand doesn't matter but anyway when you go there you usually would go and tr you know in an effort to get the job you think you have to wear the shoes you don't really doesn't really matter to be fair obviously you don't go in there with competitors but it doesn't actually matter but people do as a good omen sort of thing um it continues says this essentially um this essentially this is essentially Mr. Doe's objective. He wants to reintroduce Helmet Lang, once considered among the coolest, um, cleverest, and most modern labels in fashion, and not just for the sake of doing it. Um, he said that even when he was, I'm not, I'm not at the brand anymore. I hope I built something strong enough foundation that it goes on, which is a very mature and a clever way to approach this because he knows how fickle the industry is, right? He could be up right now, he could be the man, and then suddenly things could go completely south and it's absolutely over. So he's trying to create a legacy right now, real quick. He adopts the mindset I like with football managers where they don't talk about having time. You earn time based on good collections. I don't believe you should be just be given an unlimited time to just do and tell you entire story no you need to hit out of the park you need to be commercially viable you need to like you know appeal to the fucking heads you need to appeal to the people on social media the shoppers you got to hit it across the park across you know every single segment or every single sector you have to at least hit a seven it's super hard but that's why these guys get paid the big bucks you know what i mean to be creative directors because it's incredibly difficult to do all of those sort of things to balance um you know um art and commerce at the highest levels possible it continues mr mr lange self-taught designer from austria 
da, 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 was um, early to the se selling of luxury jeans and being and beginning in Paris in the mid 1980s, he became known for his clothes that were utilitarian and witty. He popularized slender androgynous suits. He used sheer lay lay layerings and cutouts to suggest sex in a kind of unsexy way and the anti va sorry the anti vava voom so said anti vax <laughs> the anti vava voom um like a nipple popping out of a men's tank top um in that it can be hard to feel interesting it can be hard to feel interesting while getting uh, dressed to push the envelope of style without feeling like you're wearing a costume or sacrificing tailoring fit. But Mr. Lang made it easier, at least for those who could afford his clothes. Dresses and jackets started from $700 or from $1,740 right now. Yet after Mr. Lang left the company in 20, 2005, and despite efforts by the new owners and several new designers, the brands never recaptured the Y2K era relevant. Mr. Doe is now feeling the pressure to deliver. He will introduce his first Hermit Land collection on Friday, and it's the most anticipated show in New York. I'm running on adrenaline, said Mr. Doe. Um, six days before the runway show, sitting on a bench on the waterfront outside of his apartment in Williamsburg, neighborhood of Brooklyn, it was a perfect morning. The sun inched over the high rise condos, casting a shadow across half of Mr. Doe's face. I wonder does he, when he's doing interviews with, with press, does he take off his face mask or he just leave it on the whole time? I wonder. Um, it was an apt image. As a designer, he had been split in half this year, dividing attention between Helmut Lang and his namesake label, which plans to have a runway show in Paris and release a Banana Republic collaboration this month. Fuck you know, he's got a lot on his plate, isn't it? This is what happens when celebrated emergent designers are successful. Self bifurcation. Um, they build up their own labels, sometimes from scraps. They get recruited to run bigger brands with in house ateliers and merchandising teams and, co and corporate overlords. They delegate more than sleep, more but sleep less earlier this summer mr doe began carrying two cell phones one for each job mama i feel like i'm crashing at some point he said still he smiled oh this doesn't sound good in it? it sounds like he's already feeling the pressure so maybe that's what we saw on the runway we saw a very tentative and nervous collection i liked it personally but it didn't really go out there to say a lot even though there was a poem and it was really good kind of feel behind there a lot of emotion you saw him crying at the end of the runway it did kind of feel a little bit tentative and maybe that's the reason why he was feeling a lot of the pressure and he just went maybe a bit more safer than probably he should have who knows we continue on the note of mr doe's smile he doesn't typically show it in public he wears a face mask when being photographed or attending industry events not while working in the studio however or while walking his dog uni a shibu inu or around his neighborhood with his longtime roommate lydia Suka. Kato, the operations director Peter Doe and his boyfriend Matthew Jamison. Matthew Jamison. Jamison, right? The design director at Le Labo Fragrances. Oh, okay, that's cute. Um, so their house smells nice and they've got a brilliant wardrobe. Good to see. Mr. Doe only hides in public. It's less extreme em emulation of his heroes, Martin Margiela, and an avant garde designer who declined photographs entirely, along with interviews and post show runway bows. Still, when people know, when people now ask Mr. Doe why he wears a mask, he has somewhat lost the plot. He says, there isn't one single answer that I can give, he said. I just wanted people to talk about the work and dissect the work. I don't really understand why it's such an important thing. Maybe it's backfired. Yeah, he knows why it's important. To be fair, the mask kind of added to his mystique. It added to the allure of what he was making. The fact that he didn't want to show his face, even though he was making these brilliant, um, really fresh clothes, amazing tailoring. Uh, you know, he kind of had his finger on the pulse. He had his whole crew of like super cool girls that were all around the world, especially parts in Europe. They're absolutely obsessed over the stuff that he wore and they kind of you know, helped to kind of propel the brand. But obviously his look and how he approached fashion definitely did lend to it. So I'm sure he knows, but... It must get annoying having to answer the question all the time um, why you don't. I think it's a good thing if you can to have some level of anonymity. You're able to just design, you, especially if you don't care about the clout of like, because there's some people that do, right? Someone that like for sure, like a Matthew Williams, right? Um, or like a Virgil Abloh RIP. Those guys cared about their image. They cared about walking into a room and everybody knowing, oh my God, that's that Louis Vuitton guy. That's a Givenchy dude. That's a, a leak. So I mean, that's that. Like they want to be known. Heron Preston's a good idea as well. Another one. Those guys want to be seen. Even Charles Jeffrey, my guy, he wants to be seen. That's fine. But there's some designers who are just all about the work. And if their work is selling and they don't need to be seen, why be seen? I get it. 
we continue here. Maybe not. There's ample discussions of Mr. Do's work among his online fan base, including on TikTok, which seems like an evolution of Mr. Do's earlier adoption of Tumblr. It continues, Mr. Do's known for dramatic, elegant silhouettes, billowing shirt dresses and oversized blazers, and coats of exposed backs, often in neutral or muted colours, as it designed under the assumption that a bold shape can outshout a bold colour on any day. Despite the enthusiasm for the brand among young fashion people, there are not clothes for cool people. Uh, Peter Do offers a grown-up intellectual glamour made to last forever they're priced that way too dresses and jackets exceed three thousand dollars and jeans run more than 800 i still see a lot of cool people wearing it to be fair maybe he doesn't intend it to be for the cool kids um but they do definitely wear it um he came onto the scene like a lightning rod said designer philip lim who founded his brand in new york almost 20 years ago he was born with tailoring chalk in his hands definitely agree with that one um mr doe um confessional more more confessional millennial than ironic zuma once compared designing a collection to making foe with his father a former army chief who brought his family to philadelphia from vietnam when mr doe was 14 i think they pronounced it vietnam right vietnam um it took it took hard work and lots of practice says mr doe and um, wrote in a letter to attendees for a spring 2020 runway show there were hours of simmering waiting to reduce all of that perfect and clear broth mr doe cooking hopefully he doesn't hopefully he doesn't have like a show because that would be a little bit like you know imagine he has a show where he has like a a street food market in the middle of his runway or something he turns it into like uh, like do you know what i mean that would be very 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 corny i hope that doesn't happen I hope he's just talking about his inspiration of his family and cooking just as a you know as an anecdote and he doesn't actually go all carl lagerfeld on it and just transform his runway into <laughs> into a strip somewhere in vietnam but anyway while mr doe was considering taking a job at helmet lang he'd also been weighing up the opportunity with another luxury brand Ooh, i wonder who that luxury brand was though he wouldn't reveal the name of the house he sought advice over dinners with mr lim and ruba abu sorry ruba abu nima a care director formerly of tiffany and company Okay, was this the person that got replaced by um, Alexander, whatever his name is? Oh, no. His dad kind of came in and said, hey, this is my son's job. Hilarious, actually, because I just saw recently that Tiffany re re collaborated with Ramoa. And if I'm not mistaken, that son, Alexander, is also the CEO of R Ramoa, right? So it's like he's collaborating with himself. <laughs> <laughs> alexander for alexander okay cool um anyways we could digress i wonder who the other luxury house was hmm this poor poor brand mr lang said had just been beaten and beaten to oblivion said mr uh mrs abu nima who still sometimes wears a white suede vintage helmet lang hoodie a blight on days when it's close to zero percent risk of getting it dirty he will be able i'm pretty sure to take things out of the archive and recontextualize them for 2023 and 2024 i think the actually a very difficult thing to do clearly no one else managed to do it yep classic cars one of the largest private collections of helmet lang's work is owned by new york city stylist named david casavant who began acquiring the pieces up with a five 500 them and when he was a teenager okay that's a guy on instagram um dua lipa has worn some of those nipple revealing tanks from casa vance archive rihanna wore ripped jeans solange wore a harness but generally the most requested pieces are mr lang's high quality basics as basic gets a sheer tank top or t-shirt or crop top said mr casa vance um uh, who was surprised to find this also the case of the sale he organized with Dover Street Market last year the jeans sold like crazy I think people keep coming back for that because it can be weirdly hard to find something so simple now but done the right way Mr. Doe recognizes that part of the job of Helmet Lang and is to continue offering the high quality wardrobe staples which probably answers why Kathy Horn thought he looked like Uniqlo this is his intention he wanted to have staples in there beyond the show beyond the fantasy that you're going to sell at the end of the day these are beautiful functional products that people even outside of fashion like my mum, can enjoy the prices will start at 95 dollars for a t-shirt which is very good for a designer brand to be honest and tank tops um climbing to i said it tank tops climbing to the climate to three thousand dollars um for a speciality outwear items the sizes will range from three x from three xs to three xl that's the you know i'm not gonna read the entire thing let's jump in chase through the collection itself 
I actually enjoyed it. I watched the live stream on my phone and I actually thought it was very, very good in terms of a debut. But a lot of people on fashion Twitter weren't really fans of it, maybe because it was too, you know, self-referential, digging deep too much into the archives and stuff. But like I said, for a first um, iteration to kind of cleanse the palette and to get people prepared for his era of Helmet Lang, I really liked it. Some of the tailing was great. This guy um, from, what's his face, from The Idol, one of the actors on it, he modeled in the show. A few other well known models who I'm not really too familiar with when it comes to names. And you know, I'm usually about the clothes and the designers. I'm not really too infatuated with models and stuff. But the looks were amazing. I thought they were styled pretty well. I thought the show itself was really interesting because it had the models walking sort of like as if they were walking in a busy city center like somewhere like new york and they were kind of crossing each other which was kind of hard for them to read i think a lot of them kind of you know forgot where they were meant to go but i thought it did really worked really well especially with the poem um being read um you know um from the sound and stuff of the music playing and then there was bits of the poem that was printed on the runway itself there was like a picture there was like a camera that was from the top down looking down so it kind of looked like it was a commuter you know camera kind of checking residents as they're walking across and shit i really did like it loads of the good little color block tops and t-shirts were really nice again great tailoring great jackets knits shirts trousers all of it was really nice nice color palette i think some of these looks a lot of people were kind of saying maybe reference raf simmons that calvin klein i think before i think that some people were kind of mentioning which maybe was the case but in general i thought this look and the yellow um belt around the suit kind of reminded me a little bit of the uh, iconic iconic virgil abloh designed um safety harness belt thing from off-white back in the day that everyone used to wear that i still have in my wardrobe somewhere uh, that did kind of remind me of that sort of era but again all of it was really beautiful i really enjoyed most of it and i think the really standout thing for me something i was like okay this guy kind of gets it was the shoes the detailing of the shoes these kind of reminded me oddly enough these little these hot no little these high heel shoes that might be what do you say the heel is four inches maybe five maybe six um um high heel boot with this nice cylindrical almost design of a heel at the back all black with a nice cylindrical high heel and it sort of reminded me of like an updated version of the iconic um peter doe boot that he did with the metal toe which i'm still annoyed that didn't come in men's from what i remember there was this iconic boot that all the girlies were wearing for a period of time i remember when i was going to berlin i just saw them everywhere like i remember just i think they even just relaunched at that time i went to berlin and i was just walking around kreuzberg and shit i'm just seeing all the girlies fucking wearing these amazing boots and a few guys obviously you could squeeze into size nines because i think that's the highest size they went up to but i thought they were really well done these amazing chelsea boots with this really thick sole and this amazing little um you know uh, metal plate at the front if anything they kind of reminded me of a sophisticated um luxe version of the classic dr martin with the metal toe cap or also a way more stripped and almost um minimal version of the new rock boot that i know and love i think he did them expertly but i just wish they could kind of come in men's but i guess this will definitely be unisex um you know when you kind of harken back to helmet lang and what he was kind of known for in terms of having loads of those kind of covered shows so this is going to be really cool to see and i think these are going to be a real um you know a real kind of seller when these original when these eventually do hit the stores i think people are going to go goo goo gaga over those boots so again you see some of the tailoring here you see some of the ribbons on the flipping pants and stuff and all this stuff i'm pretty sure was um stuff that they referenced from older helmet lang collections you see some classic derby shoes um again great detailing with the styling with the buttons there some really beautiful stuff i i really thought was really really nice and again a nice straight back motion and even just looking at the makeup the fact that it was you know the hair slicked back you know not much razzmatazz going on in the face i think it was very intentional to have it looking a certain way i love the stack on the bottom of the jeans here and how they kind of fall over the boots it kind of reminds me of um it actually does kind of remind me of carl lagerfeld this entire stack and how they go over the flipping boots here they look really really well look really really awesome again you've got a side view of those boots which i think are going to be absolutely you know one of the biggest sellers they're gonna fly like hotcakes people are gonna be all over those boots when they eventually do drop and yeah i did enjoy it i thought the show was absolutely amazing you have here just the the shirt with the um, i forgot the i forgot who the poet was who they were reading from but the phrase here says this is how i carry us for in your skin i've placed my trust 
so yeah great details great boots loads of great pieces of tailing loads of great pieces of layering um and again i thought a really good debut from peter doe over there at helmet lang um but of course people weren't too happy one of them being kathy horn and she has some very choice words to say about peter doe which i'm gonna quickly get on here to talk about to you so um it goes as follows this is kathy horn's review of uh, peter doe for helmet lang his debut collection it says here two years ago on the greenpoint waterfront peter doe staged his first runway show and the reassurance came striding through every look he was a minimalist in a traditional jill sander and phoebe fowler for whom he worked for at celine but he put his own stamp on the form with flowing white silk shirts printed with exploded flower and an airy suits in a pl in a palest pink and taupe that caught a modern vibe a native of vietnam who arrived in the united states at 14 and got around got turned onto fashion by a project runway doe could make his references slide between two cultures like a sl sl like a side split tun tunic in a pale pink worn over a lighter shade pink trousers and finished off with a laser fitting coat he wasn't heavy-handed and that in itself suggested a substantial design in the making new york needed that more than ever so when fast retailing a parent company of uniqlo announced that there will be the new designer helmet lang another of his brands it made sense that didn't quite happen on friday and the new york spring collections got underway in the sweltering heat though certainly navigated lang's um, straightest line tailoring and opening with suits with a fuchsia stripe down the size of the pants and a nod to the well-known lang collection the austrian designer retired from fashion 2005 after selling his brand and though evoked lang's taste for the ordinary garments like a t-shirt but everything in context when lang appeared on the paris fashion week scene sorry on the paris scene in 1980s almost everything that was extremely glamorous or in the case of thierry mugler and um, jean-paul gaultier um, an extremely camp version of glitz Gianni versace was doing his own version um, of sexy glamour in milan and lang was a blunt counter to all of that and putting an ordinary undershirt or utilitarian trench coat on the runway and calling it fashion was starting at the time it was new plus the amazing thing about lang was that his clothing made you feel differently when you wore it it was in the specific cut of his suit jackets and coats i remember a stylist telling me in the mid 90s that they sort of grabbed you lang's clothes delivered a different sexual charge and you couldn't quite put your finger on why um, we're obviously to a point now where a t-shirt or a simple cotton shirt tucked into a pair of jeans means nothing on those runway there were merely reiterations of lang's um, significance sorry signifiers devoid of meaning the same was largely true of his tailoring my thought while watching the show was <laughs> these clothes are cool and they these clothes are not cool sorry and they could be though obviously um, has a daunting task ahead of him and if he wants to make a real project of helmet lang and have some fun in the process he has to first get to the bottom of the lang's um, sensibility what made him so different and then find the relatable beat in the present moment Heidi Semaine did the smart thing when he took over at Saint Laurent after Tom Ford though his approach was initially annoying and seemingly lazy yes because Kathy Horn was one of the people to criticize Heidi Semaine a lot during those times so much so that I think she's still banned she might still be banned from covering anything that he does actually because she was very scathing of his earlier reviews um early collections which kind of you know she, she she's not on the right side of history because those early saint laurent collections essentially birthed a whole segment of fashion and menswear especially when i think of brands like the fear of god um mike and mary um and a few others right they all got birthed from hedy Semaine's era at fucking saint laurent do your fucking googles um it continues here um, Semaine located the moment in Saint Laurent's career when the designer was truly subversive, roughly between 1965 and 1970. When he did the original tuxedo, the baby doll dresses and the pop art dresses and the see-through black blouse. And for me, that's where Semaine found his modern link and then he took those styles further. Doe is going to have to try to find his own point of contact and with Lang and then express that spirit through the contemporary way without respect to his legacy otherwise we might as well go to Uniqlo which is fucking brutal so I guess 
what she's trying to say is that maybe he's referencing too much he's trying to take on too much he's trying to reference too much of the helmet lang legacy or archives you should pick a particular time period lays it in on it and reinterpret it or re-showcase it the way he wants to in his own vision fair enough i guess you have to wait and see the only thing that i don't like about this stuff and i think i've seen a few people online saying you know bad things about the helmet lang collection is that in my opinion i've always felt like to some extent peter doe was kind of overrated i liked what he did overall but i thought the way that some of the girlies and the gays and the people just in general who like fashion on fashion twitter and fashion social media when they talk about peter doe you think it'd be a little bit more interesting than what it actually is i think it was cool i think it caught a moment i think it, obviously he's able to you know he was able to capture a vibe and put that into his clothing and shit and his approach and how he just communicates and the way he carries himself and playing his experience all those things kind of played into it but when you actually look at the collections they've always been in my opinion a tad underwhelming so i was always annoyed that people didn't call it out because i guess they wanted to be a part of that core group that you know knows him and hangs around in that group or loves what he does and stuff and they were never really honest about these collections so that's why when it comes to the helmet lang stuff it's a lot more easier to say because it's not really him right he's like him designing for another brand so it's it's there's like um there's more degrees of separation people to like feel comfortable enough to say stuff which i don't really rate because i look back to some of his previous collections and in my personal opinion i thought it was starting to get hit and miss maybe around because i think if i'm not mistaken the if i'm not mistaken the boot itself might have come around 2020 the boot i'm talking about with the metal toe so i think ever since 2021 or maybe 20 yeah every 2021 onwards it's been hit and miss hit and miss hit and miss collection wise it's not really been that great and it's been quite repetitive and if anything i felt like when you got appointed that helmet lang it would actually be a good thing which is weird to say this right i thought you'd actually refresh his namesake label as a somewhat um you know what's that thing called bedroom creative myself i always feel like whenever i've got more projects on and i'm trying to balance more plates usually it brings out the best in me because i'm able to split my mind or you know across different projects across different platforms across different planes at the same time while doing work and thinking of other things at the same time also it just i don't know by default that's what i like i guess some people some some other people like to do one thing at a time but i think there are some of those designers that do exist that they do benefit from operating at the highest level on different projects at the same time obviously a obvious example would be virgil abloh rip so i thought if peter Doe gets the helmet lang job um he would actually even though they're you know even though their um, aesthetic is somewhat similar there's a lot there's a lot of differences between what they do and the customers they may be appealed to that there could be an opportunity for him to sort of split his brain but also be able to kind of inspire himself so that when he then goes to when he then goes back to design under his namesake label he's got a sense of freedom and appreciation for what he does because he's not you know he's not sort of like having to answer to his corporate overlords that it would give him a a, an extra kick up the ass it would kind of give him a new lease of life and a new bit of energy to kind of attack his namesake label the way he attacked it when he first came into the scene because it felt like for me he started to run out with ideas personally when it came to his new collections i thought maybe one of the standout ones in recent years had to have been spring 2023 but i thought the rest of them were very very hit and miss for the most part so um like i said i thought the debut was really good i really did enjoy it i think a lot of it's going to be um it's going to sell pretty well i think it all looks very wearable um i'm mean, eager to see what those boots with the silver heel end up looking like in real life and what the price is going to be um and hopefully they are going to be made in men's i'm hoping they are and you know they're able to kind of get them in some way shape or form so big up peter doe anyway a um, great debut and i can't wait to see more from the guy when that eventually happens i cannot wait to see more i cannot cannot wait to see more next we have to mention this article courtesy of complex that's been absolutely running riot and causing loads of angry debates um passionate debates furious debates with my side of the internet regarding the streetwear power ranking courtesy of complex um complex do a really good job at kind of riding the algorithm becoming viral by having this sort of like listicle type things right whether it's with hip-hop and shit whether it's with songs whether it's with rappers whatever right they have a good job of like stirring up controversy and clicks and engagement so i guess you should probably look at it through that lens but i haven't really seen people 
do this before like a power ranking or maybe i haven't noticed it from previous years i know hypebeast does like the 100 most important people but it's just the same old fucking names and it's not really that important but this power ranking to say who's first and who's second who's third who's fourth or fifth and actually ranking them in terms of their you know influence on a scene is going to be very interesting to see because i'm sure they must have fucked up a bunch because i saw people crying about it online but i wanted to save it so i could react to it in real time with you guys here so courtesy of complex it says the streetwear power ranking the complex streetwear power ranking reflects which individuals have the most power in streetwear from Tremaine Emery to Pharrell to Yoon An so let's let's continue this article it says how do you define streetwear in 2023 um this is a complicated question since the category used to feel very specific in the 90s streetwear brands drew then a new shop cultures like skateboarding punk hip-hop and graffiti they produced literal streetwear like t-shirts hoodie jeans and tracksuits and sneakers that targeted younger audiences but the category has evolved and subcultures as it reflects and are now multi-billion dollar industries which themselves are the, the definition of streetwear much more nebulous and in our opinion it's a good thing it's always been a good thing i think that was one of the things i didn't agree with virgil um before he passed away his kind of rejection of streetwear i always felt like it was a much better way to categorize what these guys were doing than fashion fashion with a capital f i feel like is best presented when it comes to women's fashion in my personal opinion i don't really think men's fashion ever hits the heady heights of women because women just do fashion better than us i don't know why that is maybe they're able to you know maybe they're able to kind of dream and fantasize and create these very immersive worlds way more than us like men maybe they don't wear you know as many functional pieces of clothing it's all about style and shit and we're all about pockets and hoods and materials and all that nonsense i don't really know but i always thought streetwear was a better way to kind of encapsulate whatever it is you're doing as opposed to fashion with an f or even just menswear but a lot of designers you know they look at fashion and they think that's the you know that's the zenith that's the fucking the top of Mount kinemanjaro that's what i need to be at and they kind of poo poo away fashion they go to fashion they realize they're not cut out for it and then they try to slink back into the streetwear i fucking hate it or well, we continue we define streetwear as clothing that appeals to youth culture and taps into the zeitgeist it still references hip-hop skate punk graffiti i wonder how many people kids nowadays can name a punk song and can actually tag let alone do an ollie because I thought those were all the fundamental parts of me getting to the scene. When I was going on Crooked Tongues forums, when I was arguing with fucking old men on Fifth Dimension forum, when I was posting fits on FUK, when I was hanging around on fucking Super Future forum, part of the, part of the fucking initiation process was to be about it. You didn't want to just talk. You wanted to be about it. So you'd be in your garden trying to learn how to ollie. You'd be writing in your sketchbook and trying to, you know, trying to get your fucking tag right. Um you know <laughs> trying to do that and then going outside and failing you were trying to go to loads of interesting punk or metal shows and take pictures and buy the band t-shirts you wanted to be you wanted to be about it right you didn't just want to just wear a t-shirt for the sake of it and have not have no idea what the band was you wanted to live it now they just not doesn't really feel like it. everything feels like an aesthetic or as the kids say nowadays an aura right a vibe um which is disappointing really because i feel like just dabbling into these things even if you don't do them well they will usually yield good results because you're going to get something from it in the end, I feel like. But hey, what do I know? But the consumer base is broader and it's not dedicated to the price point. So it's not dictated by a price point. If Gucci can sell a $500 t-shirt, why can't a streetwear designer? Um, some consumers like resellers look to streetwear for financial gain. Others participate because they want to follow trends. Okay, cool. Well, too much of this shit. So who do they got here? oh no they've got this donut um the guy from fucking um what's it called what's his brand called again they've got colin D delane calm delane sorry colin calm delane from um kid super the guy who i always say if you're in fashion and you've got a bit of imposter syndrome please look at kid super that guy won an lvmh prize designing the shit that he does right that looks no it looks like a fucking modern day version of peg leg and he won fucking LVMH prize. So if you've got imposter syndrome, you feel like you don't belong, you feel like you're getting, you know, dagger eyes from your lecturers at St. Martin's like I used to get, if you feel like you are, you know, you're slacking behind some of the students in your class like I used to do, don't feel discouraged, keep plugging away, because if Con Delane can get an LVMH prize, so can you for blood clot. It continues. We've got Clint419 um, from Cortez at 24. I think that's a bit low. Considering the fucking absolute chokehold this guy has on kids between the ages of like 15 and 22 
right he goes to he's done it because the thing you have to consider he doesn't just do these drops in london and cause roadblocks he goes to new york he's been to like paris and shit like he goes to different parts of the world he's able to do these surprise drops whether it's trainers or hoodies and t-shirts and shit and he has the kids running has the kids queuing outside of shops has the kids right and coordinates into their phone to find drops with sneakers like it's fucking immense he fucking crowdsources designs for football jerseys like the kids really fuck with him heavy so i think 24 is really low for clint in my personal opinion it's super super low 24 um because i don't think he, you know, what, what what does kid super have really on the industry if it's a power ranking influence overall right because that's that that's the thing right um let's see um these lists aren't meant to troll they're meant to be tell a story about the state of the industry and we love and respect with that being so okay what's the hold on um how did we make this list we included people who make and sell apparel and sneakers we expect which explains why people like isaac Brocky or Sias and matthew henson who are both incredible influential on the list okay um then a panel including a well-informed members of the style and sneakers team hopefully they didn't get fucking jeff state hopefully jeff staples not in this list if he's on this list then this list is fucking gob um their current relevance and brand desirability so that's the list here so they included um they have to make stuff the categories include their overall is sorry let me put it here their overall influence in fashion right now their current relevance and brand desirability, their overall body of work, their styling power consistency, the value they bring to the larger brands. And after telling all those scores, we hashed it out. Okay, cool. That's how they scored it. I still think these guys are, I, I don't think Combe belongs in the top 25 per se, maybe top 50, not top 25. And I think Clint's too low. We continue. We've got Angelo back from, uh, what's that brand called? What's the fucking called again? Awake, Aways, what's it called? Awake NY, um, former Supreme Team guy, and now got his own brand. <sighs> Is twenty three too low or too high for Angelo Back? Hmm. I say he's probably just about right. He probably belongs in the top twenty five. You think of the Asex collaborations. You think about the sellout and the stuff alone. You think about the Dover Street activations. You think about his connections overall, the store. Like, yeah, maybe 23 is probably right. Maybe top 25 is right. You continue. You've got Yoon An from Ambush. I think this is a bit too high. Um, Yoon is kind of weird, isn't it? In that the fashion doesn't really match the sneaker collaborations in terms of hype or desirability. I don't think anyone really checks for the clothes that she makes on the runway. I don't really know if they sell well in clo in actual stores. I'm not really too sure. Um, but she seems to be a supreme creative. She seems to be able to operate and collaborate with these big brands and corporations very, very easily. And she's been involved in the scene for a very long time. Like she's an actual OG. But I don't think the fashion matches the shoes, the collabs. They seem to be the ones that people actually resonate more to with her. Um, I'm still annoyed that I haven't got a fucking day. I did remember tweeting her one time about wondering when those fucking New Rock boots, the kind of New Rock style boots that she put out for one of her recent um, ambush collections would come out. I've not got any idea. You know, these people, you tweet them sometimes, ask them questions and they don't fucking answer. They just keep posting more fucking lift selfies, which is fucking annoying. But apart from that, I think this is probably a little bit of a, I wouldn't have her on a list because I said, I don't think people check for her clothes. I think people mostly check for her shoes and I don't think just making shoes should be enough for you to have to, it sh unless you're like, you know, Joe Fresh Goods, who's actually culturally relevant. I don't think you just should belong here for sneakers only. It should be a little bit more than that. But hey, what do I know? Kanye West 21 is insane. <laughs> like that is so low. That is so disrespectful. Considering that that palette or just the silhouettes that he has at Yeezy has influenced all the brands that exist nowadays like there's an entire what's that brand there's one brand that's like their color scheme is blue and they just copy all the shapes that that that, that kanye has done under yeezy so the fact that he's 21 and even just forget his stuff just the influence he's had alone on kids wearing balenciaga should be enough for him to be a bit higher on the list 21 is insane um who's here who's above him chris gibbs come on bro come on man come on you saying the guy from Union is above Kanye? And look, they do some cool shit. Like Union, Chris Gibbs and his wife should be higher up the list. They should be probably top ten, but he doesn't belong higher than 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 Kanye. That 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 doesn't make any sense, really and truly. 
yes collaborations bang yes the store union is a fucking is literally um one of our last iconic stores in streetwear um the selections in there are amazing they've got a great buying team i'm not sure if it's just him and his wife that does it or other people that do it um they're clearly ogs and storied in there like great but above kanye 20 insane um grace while bono at 19 is also pretty insane um when you think of streetwear is she even a streetwear designer like that's actually a, i think that's more of an insult if you're grace wells bono you'd probably be a bit annoyed N number one you'd be annoyed that you're on the list and number two you'd be annoyed that you're 19 that's a little bit mm, i'm not really for that we continue um lev tanju from i guess this is from palace right again as much as i hate the brand right and i hate the fucking faux you know hard nut fucking image they have of it and everything about it and it's obviously a little bit cringe and it's turned into a massive collaboration incubator. 18 is also kind of low. As much as I fucking detest everything about the brand, right? And if I see another fucking trifig, I'm going to fucking vomit over my own shirt. You know, and people that wear fucking loafers with their tracksuit pants and sovereigns and gold tooth caps and fucking drink Stella, you know, and Amstel outside of pubs and shit. It's annoying. Let's be honest. 18 is low. They scummed them. Palace should be way higher. They should be definitely top 10. Like, definitely top 10. Not above Kanye, but definitely top 10. Um, it continues. Salili Bembry, 17. Again, I think it's too low for him. When you think about the influence those fucking um, Crocs have had on everybody, when you think back to the Versace's that he did, um, the, what do you call it? The link, I forgot the name of him, the l double link. I forgot what the name of him, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, you think about his aesthetic overall. You think about stuff that he did with New Balance um yeah 17 is too low way too way too fucking low um joe fresh goods again 16 for me is probably too low for his influence collaborations wise activations wise the storytelling um what he means for his local community um just in terms of representation i know it shouldn't be a thing but still yeah too low too 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 low um james whitner who is the guy from i guess what's that phone called again uh Whitaker Group. Was that what's Whitaker Group? I don't know Whitaker Group. This is one thing I don't know. I thought he was from the other one. The one that's got the French name that do the Jordan collaborations. But I don't really know this guy, so I'm not really is that that's him, right? Yeah, that is. He's from the shop called um Ama Mania in Atlanta, right? So I don't know. This is more of an American thing as well, isn't it? Because if it's worldwide and he's there, where does Pata fit into it then? Because Pat is fucking worldwide. And I think Pat has got, is way more well-known or way more influential in culture than, um, uh, how do you pronounce it? Ama Mania. He has to do good collaboration, but I think outside of the collabs of the shoes, do people really care about the clothes that much? I'm not really too sure. It's very American, you know, type of thing. It's obviously come from American perspective and complex, but let's see what Pat is compared to them. Let's continue. Nigo at 414 is wild. To be fair, maybe Nigo is kind of you know he's grown out of streetwear he's not really a streetwear guy anymore so maybe this is a bit of an insult to him also um but having him at 14 is kind of wild considering the influence that he's had considering that he is one of the godfathers of streetwear alongside hiroshi fujiwara i'm not too sure i'm not too sure about that one uh, maybe i just won't have him on the list i'll be a bit more strict with that one tyler creator i think should be on the list that's a very that's a bit of a wild card but i would include him on there collaborations with converse his own um line when it comes to um golf le fleur when it comes to the re you know um odd future so the golf uh, obviously has been relaunched um his approach you know his activations with his fragrance and all that stuff i think he should be a good choice as a wild card. I'd probably have him maybe a bit lower in the list, but he's a good addition on there. It's 13. Ruigi Villasenor, even though he did the he did the old scammy scam with Rude. Interesting at number 12. Having Rude above Yeezy is actually rude, to be honest. <laughs> you know? And if you've got people suing you, should you be on these lists anyway? If you've got one of your partners with an open lawsuit against you because you've been allegedly embezzling funds to fund your Birkin purchases and flights around the world, should you really, really be on a list about with brands? I don't really know. And I also think maybe this list, maybe he belongs on this list five years ago. I think he would have belonged on it. But does he belong on it right now? That's the thing that I'm fucking thinking. I'm not really too sure about. Should he be on this list right now? 
I don't really know. You know, that's the only thing I'm really kind of dubious about, to be completely honest. Um, did they mention the fucking the, the lawsuit? Uh, Vince Neal has had a rough 2000. Yeah, they did, right? 2023. Um, in May, he parted way with Bally after just one season. Actually, you know what's funny? Since he left Bally, those boots he designed, the last collection, the yellow ones, the snakeskin ones, and the mules, a lot of my fashion Twitter friends have been going goo goo gaga over them. So it's a bit sad and bittersweet that he didn't get a chance to, you know, finish that story. Um, but now, you know, after the fact, people are realizing, oh, those boots were actually really nice. Those mules were actually incredibly luxurious, comfortable, and just swaggy. And now they're going crazy for them. But I guess, you know, maybe the new person comes in and doesn't want to you know carry on the style maybe the bat the belly brand don't want to carry on but yeah i saw that um roughly a month later he was named in a lawsuit that accused him of funding his own personal expenses with millions of dollars from his brand um rude revenue ironically even the senior's luxury excursions amid yachts and mediterranean waters had helped grow the brand exactly a law is because um people associate with the senior and his clothing with an aspirational lifestyle he's basically like the andrew tate of clothing right <laughs> if that makes sense right that's basically what he's doing he's he's in it like actually i think about it aaron bondroff was ahead of his time he was the one that kind of to me told you know was preaching the doctrine or preaching the philosophy or preaching the fucking gospel of turning your lifestyle into a job being able to just make money being you and these guys obviously figured it out in their own ways, but he was the first person I heard do that. And I think I think he mentioned it in one of the early Heron Preston interviews that doesn't really exist on the internet anymore. He interviews Heron Preston, and it's all about lifestyle design, it's all about self-actualization, speaking stuff into existence and shit. But that lifestyle design shit is something that I always kind of hold dear to my heart. And I think I'm currently pursuing it, obviously, now with the podcasting and streaming thing that I'm doing now, where you get to kind of, you know, live life on your terms, doing the things that you actually enjoy. Um, and yeah and uh rude took that and ran with it right um da -da -da -da. so yeah they're, they're, they're talking about that but okay let's continue martin rose at 11 is incredibly low personally for me also um when you're talking about influence on streetwear and fashion i think she's probably i think you could you have to choose between martin rose and grace balls bonner you can't have both i think i would choose martin rose or grace Ball bonner because of her influence across you know being able to kind of link streetwear and menswear and fashion together the obviously the footwear collaborations the history with denmark all of that sort of stuff in one i think kind of plays its role and obviously you know people go google gaga over her clothes like fashion kids and streetwear kids fucking love martin rose so i'd probably put her in that list but obviously you have to choose between one or the other you couldn't have grace wells bonner and martin rose in this list in my opinion um cactus plant obviously belongs in this list it doesn't need to be argued about you might not like what they do but you know they are very influential who's the founders on there the founders are um camilla ekel from triple five soul and erin mcgee um really or no this, sorry that's not what we're saying that's not the person the person's somebody else it's like an asian name so the, the the article says with exceptions of camilla echo and erin mcgee from supreme um it's been historically difficult for women to make a name in the male dominated streetwear they should have also have included leah mcsweeney of married to the mob she's also an og but Catus plan has done it blah 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 okay cool um Travis Scott's involved there in a the street red thing. He probably should be involved. I that thing's a good sign. We've got David Sinatra from I guess from Stussy. Okay, that, is that who's that who's leading the thing? His name's David Sinatra. Fucking cool. Um, David Sinatra is what well, isn't well known. Most of the names on this, but when you're CEO of the biggest, uh, the, you're the street red brand. Da, 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 da. Yeah, cool. So Stussy belongs on there for sure. I wonder where Supreme is then. Oh come on, this is fucking bullshit. Alexander Arnold, he can't dress. Do you see when he had to put his fucking Tiffany Air Force Ones on and he was sitting at the NBA game? He looks like he could be one of Trump's sons. He's got zero swag. How can Alexander Arnold be on the streetwear power rankings just because his dad owns fucking LVMH and he gets to run Kering and Tiff and Tiffany, you know, in the biggest case of nepotism you've ever seen in your entire life and produces one of the worst Air Force One Tiffany collaborations I've seen in my entire life also. What's way to opportunity? He shouldn't be on that list. Come on, come on. Just because you, again, you're the head of the, again of Tiffany and, and Ramoa doesn't mean you should be on the streetwear power ranking. Really, think about it. What are they putting him on there because of the Ramoa Supreme collaboration? Like, that is insane. Nah, he doesn't belong in that list at all. That's a horrible addition. He's above, he's above Kanye. Come on, bro. 
Um, Ronnie Fake should be on there from Kiff. Yep, we know that. James Jebby should be, you know, that's that that goes without saying. It's funny, they're going to put Tremaine above James Jebby. <laughs> then them tears isn't, come on, bro. I, I like that what they do and stuff. They've got some cool jeans. They've got some decent bits and pieces, but you can't say in a streetwear power ranking that Denim Tears has more influence than Supreme. Just through pure numbers alone, it's not true. Through pure influence, it's not true. Through years in the game, it's not true. And through the time that they're still at the top of their level, the top of the game, it's not true. This is a crazy list. I think Tremaine's going to be above James Jebbia. Yeah, Pharrell's number four, which is an odd addition because, he's not. again, he's also evolved out of streetwear now for the most part um you got jerry lorenzo he probably should be on that list but again should he be above yay yay taught him like it's odd right i mean your your mentor you're above your mentor even though you, the work that you do isn't as forward thinking as your anyway, whatever um i'm still curious to see what the adidas collaboration happens there i wonder what's going on adidas and these brands that are not nike are so slow to move Right, they don't move quickly like that girl that won the U.S. Open. Um, I forgot her name. Sorry, the black girl. Kind of, his name escapes me. There's a really amazing clip of her when she's young, watching the fucking you know U.S. Open. She might look. She looks like she's like ten or something. If that was Nike, they would have had that in an advert, um, or in some sort of skit, or in some Instagram short or something. Very, very quickly done already. But he's because she signed to New Balance, it doesn't happen quickly enough. Yeah, that's some Jay Lorenzo stuff. It should, you know, there's all this hype around it. It was gonna be a basketball thing. It was gonna be sports where it wasn't just going to be you know um lifestyle stuff we still haven't seen anything the wheels are moving super slow and i wonder what's going on is it just like a you know money thing are they not sure it's going to work is there what what's going on like we're still waiting for him to drop he hasn't dropped number two tremaine emery come on bro that's too high he should be probably top 10 but he doesn't belong ab above all those other mentions that names i mentioned especially not james jebby that's insane who's number one Teddy Santos from what? Uh, 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 um, Amelion Dior. That's a weird addition of number one. Really and truly, that's super, super strange. Number one, Amy. I don't even think they should be above Stussy and Supreme. They still got the, the biggest grip on most people. Most kids, you know, that fucking eight ball jumper or anything with an eight ball on it, anything with a Stussy script, anything with a Supreme logo on it. Anything that's been worn by one of those cool kids that skate for Supreme, like Tyshawn and all those dudes, sells like hotcakes, they should probably be one and two and the rest can fight for their other positions. But Teddy Santos, number one. Him, number one, and that kid super guy being last, just threw the whole list off to me. And having both Martin Rose and Gross Bonner throws a little off for me. Having both Travis Scott and Tyler throws it off me. I think you have to choose one of the... one. Of, one or the other to make the list a bit more concise and obviously include some other names here that haven't been included but yeah this is a weird list man as a as a power ranking a bit of a strange one um but again it goes to show the undenying influence on streetwear overall but hey what do i know what do i know so let's move on from that one we spoke about it we've given it our best we're gonna move on to one of the more interesting topics of the past couple of 24 hours. So if you're not in the UK, you wouldn't have known, but on my side of Twitter and social media, there's been a crazy, crazy event happening where this young lady has walked into a hair salon, sorry, a, a beauty store here in London where they sell extensions and beauty products and hair stuff, you know, the usual stuff um, for mostly black people or Afro people or Asian people, people that are not non-white, I'd assume, those kind of hair products you go over there to go and get, especially specialist products you might be able to get in certain supermarkets and according to the information that we had when the video first came out the lady was trying to get a refund and the shop owner wouldn't allow her to get a refund and i think the initial story was that she gave the woman store credit she didn't want to accept it so then she left with the items that she came in with but then as the video plays you'll see the store owner essentially strangle her grab her from you know around her have put his hands around her neck and start dragging her all around the shop and it looks really really crazy but as you know most of you will know 
when these videos come online, you should never ever take them on face value because sometimes, especially if the person's arguing as they're recording, they usually record them to sort of like make themselves look better. They don't want to, you know, they don't want the truth to come out. So they want to appear a certain way. So they'll start recording when they feel like they're in the right and then it loses a lot of the context. But now we've got the added, added angles and whatnot and different accounts from people. I'm still a little bit unsure as where I stand on it because depending on who you believe, of the story it will affect how you view what you see but i'm going to play the entirety of the thing because i put the clips together in this little youtube video so you can see what people are talking about online so you can kind of maybe form your own opinion so the first clip is what went viral what kind of touched the internet and what everyone kind of responded to and it kind of shows an image inside the hair shop and you see a black girl there being restrained by an asian guy who i guess is one of the owners of the store or a manager or something and then it kind of continues on there so let's play the video. Oh, look, 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 look. You can't. I'm going to call the police. I'm going to call the police. Babe, babe, babe. Fuck it, look, thank you, recording. Recording, call the police. Call the police. Call the police. Call the fucking police. Call the fucking police. Call the fucking police. Is this what this is, babe? I'm calling the police. Babe, this man put his neck on me. This boy, this man, um, this man just strangled me, brother. This get off me. This man just strangled me. Get the a picture of the outside then we got then we got cctv showing different angles of what occurred and it's just silent so you won't be able to there's no sound on this one but you see a different cctv angle that kind of gives a, maybe a bit of the build-up before the strangulation gate happened you see the owner going behind the tills he's walking back in front of the tills maybe nothing's occurred just yet he walks to the door holding his phone and I think it switches to another angle here in a second. Maybe I think this is after it. I'm not really sure, but something's happened here. It switches the angle after. Let's wait for it to switch in a minute. So people are inside, you know, acting nonchalant as we do here in England. Oh, I can feel it. This is when it actually went down. The lady tried to leave. And this, I guess, is them scuffling. As you see the one lady kind of moving out of the way. You see the bucket. You see the basket. You see him dragging the girl in back the store. Fucking choking her around the neck. It's fucking crazy. Another angle of it. So you can see the full thing. You see the lady coming in from the right-hand side, I think, here. She's trying to leave the store. The guy's stopping her. Um, like he's playing football or something. He's still stopping her. He's pushing her in the chest. Then he pushes her in the face. She kind of slaps him. He then gets annoyed by that. Then he starts to grab her neck from the back. And then he starts to push her back into the shop. So it depends how you see it or who slapped who first, whatever. But it looked like he got annoyed by the that. Leone says the incident was not right. And here's, and here's a report from ITV that are kind of reporting on the whole thing as well that I kind of ripped from Twitter as well that kind of speaks about it. So you can kind of hear the guy narrating and give him more background behind it. But the protesters outside say the footage is another example of violence against black women. From my experience, when we're training, we're not trained to put our hands around people's necks like that, regardless of the situation. You have training to deal with aggressive customers and that does not include strangulation, doesn't include choking. Yeah. It's just completely disrespectful. The way that people communicate, especially towards black women, needs to be in a more respectful manner. I bought quite a few things from this very store. It's disgusting to see the way that another black woman was treated. The police say the woman was arrested on suspicion of assault and later bailed pending further inquiries. Antoine Allen, ITV That's News. Hilarious. She got arrested. Not not me. And what should I, so this what is a I this is an interview with one of the, the manager that is obviously that is on the video choking the the young lady as she's about to leave the store, and he's now looking over the CCTV footage and talking to the ITV journalist and basically you know uh, pleading his case as to why he felt justified to strangle the lady in the store. So let's start from the beginning again and hear what he has to say. ITV News. Start beating me, and what should I what, what should I do? Well, many people are saying that you shouldn't have choked her. No, I did Choking means like, <laughs> it looks like I am choking her. What? What do, you, what do you think happened? It's not choking. Like I, at the moment, my hand was like, one hand was at the back. Okay. <laughs> I didn't choke her. She she walked into my my clasp hands, right? That's, that's, like what the, that's what those abusers say, right? My fist was clenched and she walked into it. Oh, it kind of reminds me of that scene in The Simpsons when Bart and Lisa are fighting and they like close their eyes and they just start swinging. It's like, oh, if you come in my way, then I can't be responsible for hitting you and shit. It's like, bro, you were choking her. It looks like I'm choking her, you know? What the muck? I was like detaining her. If you detaining could go back her. in time <laughs> yeah. to before this incident, See? would you 
act exactly the same. No, I won't behave the same. I think I like, I just want to keep her inside. It, it wasn't an intentional like, it just like get, get around her neck randomly. And if that was your <laughs> daughter or wife, how would you react? I would react the same way the people are reacting. The same thing is like what the second moment I need to think about being as a man or something like that, I should ask my daughter, what she have done? Have you done something? The owner of Peckham Hair and Cosmetics says there's no refund policy on the items the unidentified customer wanted to return. After an argument over policy, the 31-year-old woman went to the back of the store to pick up replacement items, whereas the owner went to the entrance to block her from leaving. At this point, an altercation happened before another customer recorded the now viral choking. For the people that are angry and passionate about what they're seeing in that video, do you have any regrets? Do you have a, a Definitely message? I have regrets. That's why I'm talking to you like that. These are the regrets. Like when I, when, when I told the police officer, I don't want to press the charges. These are the regrets like at that time. I don't want to press charges, he's saying. How does he get to decide that charges are not going to be pressed? This country is so backwards. How does that happen? Because even if you agree, even if you say that young lady hit this man first, say that you say that, they were still violent to each other. In my opinion, his force was excessive. She was obviously being excessive, but they were both excessive. Like it was kind of a, it was basically a fight in, for, for lack of a better term. If that happens, surely both parties should be sat down and spoken to. Why is one person in a position to say, I'm not going to press charges and the other one isn't? Just because what, she walked into his shop? Just because you walk into someone's shop, it doesn't mean they have the, you know, they have the fucking right to hit you or to choke you because you don't agree with their fucking store policy. That's not how it fucking works. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. And I think the only way to kind of look at it is to kind of view it from the point of view of like, who do you believe story-wise? If you believe the account that, this lady bought something because i saw some account that says she bought something that was defective and then i guess because it's got no refund policy she still went there and said hey this is defective maybe the bottle was open maybe it was off or something had a funky smell maybe it looked fake because a lot of these stores they would want to admit it but they do sell a lot of fake products especially creams and stuff that you're going to put on your body and whatnot it's really unsafe so maybe she said that and went back there and the guy didn't believe her because these guys just won't believe you, right? They're just going to be like, no, I don't believe you. Um, and then an argument ensued. And obviously, because both parties are not able to, to like de-escalate, they're not able to um, conflict, resolve. Um, it turned into a situation where he had to kind of, he felt like he had to choke this girl to get his message across. And she felt like she had to hit him several times to get her message across. Obviously not the great way to go about things. But I still think in these situations, just talking it from it from a man's point of view i think it's within your responsibility especially if you're talking to women especially if you're in this type of business where you own a a hair shop so you're going to have a lot of you know a cosmetic store whatever you're basically calling a beauty store you're gonna have a lot of women coming in you should be able to know how to um de-escalate situations talk to them reason with them because you can't use your force because you're a man you can't put your hands on them so you should always figure out a way to use your words to get your point across and to make it known um what the position is what what can be done what's the solution the fact that he doesn't to me in my opinion it's a big red flag that most likely this has happened before most likely he's had other instances with other women coming into the store mostly black women i'd probably assume who've given him a bit of attitude back who maybe disagreed with something he said and then they've had an argument and he's resorted to doing something where he uses his body as intimidation. He put hands on them. He says crazy shit to them. I don't think he's ever been a guy who's like been able to like de-escalate calmly, speak to them, reason with them, um, you know, take them from a 10 all the way down to a five. He can't do that. He definitely needs to have a person who will push you out of your store, to, you know, start saying expletives, kind of ban you, all this sort of nonsense. I'm sure he's that kind of guy because to go straight to that extreme, in this situation is too much because surely there could be a, a resolution that you guys can come to an agreement of whether you store credit whether you say you can only exchange it for the same item whatever it may be something like that needs to be done because women you know they take their fucking hair and beauty stuff seriously most women will probably be happy to order this stuff online because there's many realtors that will, that will ship this stuff to you even places like amazon but you go to these local stores because you can get them immediately
but then the problem with these local stores is that they have a monopoly on the in on the scene on the on the locality of where you are and they can get away with murder because you've got no other option if you want to go out you've got a party to go to you don't want to wait for something to get delivered to you you want to get it immediately you have to go to these guys to go get it and unfortunately unfortunately in my experience in london um especially in a place in london that i live in east there is a place called apton park where we have exactly the same issues there's been scores even some i think even my mum might have had an argument with one of those guys there but there's been many accounts of aunties having full-blown arguments and fights with the guys that run that hair and beauty store in um, apton park market i think there was even even a case of one of the guys in that shop um exchanging like sexual favors for like discounts I'm, honestly it gets it gets a bit grimy this industry or this scene or this sector so that's the thing that's really disappointing about it and the thing that's really disappointing about the east the apton park one they've always known to they've always there's always been known to be cunts i think the nicest hair and beauty shop i can think of in east london is the one in stratford probably in the shopping mall there's like a little hair and beauty store in there but i think of the one in east Ham. i think of the one in apton park and a few others they're all fucking cunts and they treat you like fucking shit and they kind of put you through the ringer and it's always like you know you can't use card or you couldn't spend over a certain amount no refunds all this fucking nonsense right so the really sad thing about this is that us black people, for whatever reason, we don't learn from this. We don't, especially when it comes to these sort of stores. I think of the, you know, the swanky clubs in Soho, where loads of, especially, you know, super cool, attractive looking young black girls or really, you know, suave looking young black boys will go to these clubs in Soho and go and party and stuff or have a good night. And they'll rock up to the venue and suddenly the bouncers or the door pickers are saying, not tonight, it's full. And then a whole group of white dudes will come in, a whole group of white girls will come in and they get in first. It happens all the time. And those guys and girls will get online, they'll complain about it, but then they'll go back there again the following week to try and get in and try and assimilate. I don't really like that. I don't think we need to assimilate these days. You can just create your own thing. You don't need to go and try to bloody um, shuck and jive for these people that clearly don't want you in your establishment. The same thing goes for the hair salons. The same thing goes for the fucking hair beauty shops and shit. You don't need to do that. Too many of these places have taken a piss and they've been allowed to because the aunties and the girls or whoever goes in there they just kind of have no other option and they end up shopping there again i've always been the kind of person who always votes with their feet and i just do it silently i don't really you know there's no hullabaloo about it if i don't really like things if i don't really like the people behind it like i've always said before i had a very um tetchy and bad experience with the guys behind palace and ever since then i've never worn the brand ever but i haven't made a big post about it i don't go around saying hashtag fuck palace and shit i just don't wear it you know i'm not going to support something when i think the guys behind it are cunts so the same thing goes for um these hair beauty stores if they mug you off if they you know especially if you know the the the, the, the girl that got fucking strangled in this video could be any number of black girls um in london who go to these stores on any other given day in fucking london so you should see yourself in that person because these events can escalate very quickly right you're already frustrated you've got many appointments to go to you've got to pick up your dress here you've got to get your hair done there you're already on 10 your fucking phone is whatever you're just and annoyed then you go into these stores and you got this fucking donut of a dude who doesn't know the difference between restraint and choking right and he's arguing with you and saying you can't return a defected product because it's already open it's like bruv it's defected that's why i'm coming back and giving it to you fucking cunt so i would hope that this would be a sign for people to just stop going to these stores and stop kind of giving them money so that they know to to like fix up and be well, well behaved and kind of earn your business again or another thing would be to set up your own businesses and treat people the way that you want to be treated in these kind of places but unfortunately those things don't usually end up happening and most likely all this hullabaloo will be for nothing and people just go back in there again when they need it because they've got no other options um but good thing i've seen has been some of the protest as you can see here there's people gathering outside the store in peckham protesting everything that went down standing around saying if you done it to i forgot what the chant you do it to her you done it to me outside a place called peckham hair and cosmetics and shit people have been going absolutely goo goo gaga over it and then if you read an account here from i think a young lady what's it this is the first that's the actual original account that kind of made it go viral a uh, bigger this account of a person called troy hudson when you scroll down it kind of gives more context of what actually went down let's read the first caption here the visual video she says every time i pass peckham cosmetics the staff members are screaming abuse at customers today at one for one for sorry um 
uh, 115 this lady apparently wanted a refund and was of course refused um, she went to leave and the store and this hefty man dragged her in with excessive force and strangling her right so she's already saying she's a local and she sees this happening all the time and i have to say as a local and as somebody that's grown up around the areas around apton park and shit i've seen many a people complaining and fighting with the people inside those hair and beauty stores and the ones in east ham and whatever it may be so i definitely believe that to be true um the next tweet she says i didn't take this recording another lady posted this on her ig i wouldn't have time to record this because i would be backing her up um this so i wouldn't sorry i would wouldn't have time to record this because i would be backing her up in this crazy situation yes i'm the brave to involve myself especially to defend and protect her from the audacity of this man a quick update from ig trigger warning it says 2 p.m today we assemble violence against women won't be tolerated there's a, pers a person called sace holmes lewis um it says violence against women will not be tolerated these people ex extract money from our communities every single day now we boycott them and ensure they go out of business wow so they're really going for the jugular um trigger warning this is da -da -da, so they want them to go out of business um this happens today in peckham the i i presents what's this a woman struggled by one of the workers of the cosmetic store. The woman went to ask for a refund and the man who can be seen in the video hanging her um, became <laughs> hanging her, you know, aggressive with her and the woman on bad terms left the store and he proceeded to drag her into the store. Um, this is not what we want to see on the social media or in the streets and it could happen to any of us please share this video and in the end of the video you can see the store it's after primark in the peckham high street there's more clips of here people protesting on that side chanting and shit gathering shutting the shit down i think police came after as well and interviewed people there um i don't know why the black woman still didn't go to the shop says me neither it's beyond me been bugging been begging my friends and family to stop shopping there for ages but again it's convenience brother you can't blame people do you know what i mean it's essentially you're living in a in a in a store desert right there's not a lot of these stores around where you can buy these particular items cosmetics beauty products that you can't find in other places you can't find them in boots and whatever it may be um you don't want to wait for amazon to deliver it to you maybe it's more expensive there's always a bit of a markup on those online stores so you want to get there immediately you want to maybe browse other options now like all these things are really important but unfortunately the people who have the monopoly on them don't seem to be um very um they don't really seem to be keen on having good customer service. They just know to treat you like shit because they know you have no other options but to come back there again. Um, obviously, people are posting the shop address and leaving bad reviews. Um, da -da 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 -da. So, going back to the video, who do you actually blame for the choking? That's the thing that I'm not really too sure about. And I'm, about, I'm not really too sure if it actually matters. That's what I'm trying to think because I think in this situation, men should always be in control, especially when it's a woman attacking you. You should either try to diffuse the situation, diffuse the situation, walk away, restrain, but choking her like this with both hands around her neck, you could have broke her neck, bro. Like, do you know what I mean? You could have had this woman could have died, what, because of some 50 pound weave or 100 like what like what's going on bro relax do you know what i mean you don't need to do all that it's a bit too much so for me i think the force was just excessive regardless it wasn't necessary in the slightest but if we go to the video where it shows where it happened when you see the front maybe there is a possibility you could say the girl maybe hit him first again it doesn't justify his um, response but if you're just going to go in terms of what actually happened in the video and who hit who first maybe but i'm still confused why the police didn't arrest the store owner you can't just choke someone bro um let's see or maybe the police said you can maybe that's uh, that's um, appropriate use of um restraint if it's your store so as the girl comes up to the store owner they're arguing he kind of he's kind of holding out his hands trying to push her back into the store which already is a bit of a it's not a defensive position it's more of a you're already primed to go it kind of feels like personally because there's a way to restrain it without having your hands out like you want to grab her arms and shit but anyway maybe I'm, I'm i'm being a little bit too forgiving here he keeps pushing her away she spins around she's trying to go back into store again let it load up a minute she she's trying to go by the side of him he okay that's when it that's when it gets disrespectful he keeps if you're gonna restrain her and do the whole pushy thing maybe just aim for the arms right but then the moment he pushes his hand into her face i think that's when it gets a little bit much and he oversteps his mark that's when it turns into a fight and again also think about this he's actually lucky this girl doesn't seem to have like brothers or male friends that ride for her because this could end this could have ended really badly for him 
if this is somebody else they could have gone and got their boyfriend their cousins their nephews their uncles friends from work like this could have ended very very badly especially in a place like peckham like he was really playing with fire and um, this could have gone left very very quickly you know but i guess he was hell bent on making sure she didn't leave with whatever she exchanged and again this is a dumb situation she comes in wants a refund you get into an argument she exchanged it with something that she already bought just write it off bro it's not that it's not it's not that big of a deal you can write it off and ban her from the store that still works you don't need to fucking choke her so she tries to get through and then the disrespectful point is here she tries to walk around or in between the these ladies at the till and the man then he gets offended and pushes her in the face right there that push in the face that sort of snaps her neck back and it's disrespectful because you're putting your face your hand in someone's face and she then immediately reacts like anybody would and hits him right back in the face slaps him not even a it's not even a proper slap you know what I mean? He kind of gets a little bit agitated and he sees that, oh, how can you slap? How can you slap? And that's when he gets, look, that's when he gets irate. See, he's like, look, he already probably doesn't have a lot of respect for women anyway. And he's outside, okay, cool. I'm going to teach you how to teach my daughters. Because that man said, oh, how about your daughters? Bro, he probably hits his daughters at home. That's a bad example. Jonas. This guy definitely hits his daughters. So he's not really a good example. He probably does worse for his daughters at home, I would assume. Um, but yeah, that's who I would say. I'd say they're both, uh, so I'd say they're both in the wrong for not being able to deal with this like adults but i still think you as a man should be able to de-escalate the situation especially as a shop owner especially as a shop owner where you predominantly deal with women and be able to kind of put their snippets in the bud and kind of get it over and done with there's an interview here with the owner himself i'm going to play a little bit of it um and then i'm going to continue he interviewed with some lady from gb news um let's see what he says Thank you so much, Sahel, for joining me and having this discussion. I know currently that there is a protest that's happening outside your store in Peckham. And this was down yeah. to, you know, the viral video of what I would deem and what other people are saying um, was an abusive and an aggressive interaction that took place between yourself Both people. and a Both customer, people, which I do believe <laughs> was out of context. Hence why we are having this conversation with you today. So, um, you know, what are your recollections of what, what happened in your store? She came for a refund for three packs of hair. Mm -hmm. I told her we don't do refund. Either you can exchange the stuff or you can get a credit out. So whatever you want, I can do that one. She said that one, like, the lady who was sitting here, she told me you're going to get a, she will get a refund. I said, she is not here at the moment. What I'm telling you now, I, I'm showing you the receipt. And, and we need to go through what I'm telling you now. So anyways, if you want the refund, you can do the refund, but the way you're speaking to me... Okay, he's lying straight away. He's lying. He's definitely lying. He just didn't want to give her the refund. If it's true what that lady is saying and she got the, the got the hair and she was told by the clerk who was there who was a woman don't worry i'll give like maybe it's just maybe it's a it's a fucking pro policy they have on the store but maybe case by case they're like hey if you want a refund we can give it so she approved the refund she came back the next day and unfortunately she had to see this guy and not the woman she spoke to and him fumbling his words here and i think that's where he's lying for sure he started to be rude to her. I, I, I basically think she came in already flustered and frustrated for whatever reason. She maybe had, she already had a bit of a attitude in some respect, but I don't think she had an attitude to the shopkeeper. She just probably maybe had a scowl on her face, whatever. People are allowed to walk into shops the way they want to walk into shops. And I think she, that's really why she snapped. But I still think he had ample opportunity to meet her where she was at and kind of just get to, you know, make the situation a nice interaction. He didn't. He chose to be combative. She already was having a bad day and was like, you know what, fuck it, let's go. And then whatever happened, happened. But I still think the onus is on him, especially as a shopkeeper. And secondly, as a man, talking to a woman, you don't have an option to make it physical. If it's a dude, you can. If a guy keeps chatting shit to you, you know, all men know there's always that threat of violence when it comes to, you know, verbal disagreements. Some men just don't like talking too much and they're just going to try throwing hands. But you can't do that to women, especially if you own a fucking cosmetic shop. You have to be able to know how to deal with these situations because they're going to happen quite often because women are always going to have issues with what they buy in there they want to maybe have refunds exchanges they may want to just argue for the sake of it whatever there's going to be issues you don't have to deal with it you can't just always deal with things with violence and shit and shouting but he's definitely one of those type of dudes that's not 
She was like quite aggressive, more quickly, and then she asked, "Are you gonna do it or no?" The fact that he's not placing any blame on himself is already a red flag to me because you choked the girl. So the fact that he's not saying, "Hey, I could have done better. I could have maybe de-escalated it. I could have maybe you know met her where she was at. I could have probably maybe offered some other solutions. I could have maybe spoken to her softly. Whatever." He doesn't say that. He just makes it seem that she came in like a dragon. And then she was like yelling at me, and then uh, I told her, "In this way, I can't help you." At the last, you told me, Whatever. "Are you gonna give me my money back? Yes or no?" Then I said, "No." Okay, piece of shit. So this no comes from an you know like being a man, there is an ego inside you. So sometimes you do those things. Okay, see, there we go. He's lying. Then his male ego came out and made him. Again, I don't know what the male ego has to do with a comf- with a, with a with a with a situation with a with a uh, potential customer or a customer. Usually, I've worked retail. You don't usually do that. You usually meet people where they're at. You're usually kind of numb to people freaking out on you because most of the time, it's never you. They're usually bringing in whatever baggage they have. And you usually always try to make the situation, the experience as, you know, easy as possible. And usually, by the end of it, even if you, even if a customer comes in super hot, they usually come, at the end of it, they're usually quite thankful that you didn't, you know, match their energy. You didn't go for tit for tat. And they usually sometimes, I've had some occasions where they pull you to one side and say, thank you for your service. I know I came in with a bit rude and I said a certain thing, I apologize, and they can continue moving on. But this guy doesn't know that. There's no such thing. He just has all this shit in his store that he knows all, wo- all the women in this area are going to need. And he just, you know, it's like, look, I make the rules. You have to buy here because you have no other option. But he's not in the business of trying to make it a good shopping experience in the slightest. That's not his modus operandi. If you don't buy in his terms, if you don't shop on his terms, you're an enemy. And that's what basically happened because he went from zero to 100 real quick there. Then she told me, I'm going to take the stuff from your shop and I will see who's going to stop me. Oof. Okay, so she so she kind of prompted you in like a threatening manner. Oh, come on, you stupid woman. What's that woman going to do to him threatening wise? He could just sit on her and she'd probably die, right? He could sit on her and she would die. He could sit on her chest and she would fucking die come on he was also combative he was also argumentative he was also confrontational i'm sure of it he was really pacing up and down the store on his phone acting like he was calling people to come down like he probably probably mentioned i'm gonna get my daughter here like he was acting crazy anyway let's not act like he was a saint in this yeah because she wasn't happy that she was not receiving a refund what i want to ask you sahel is of course we know that social media can make certain videos go viral to a detriment yeah. If it's really about gender and race. No, there is nothing to do with the gender or the race. She is as respectful as a name as my mother, my sister, my daughter. She is respectful. She is the lady of so being as a woman. She is the same as the other woman. There's no <laughs> nothing like she she she's from some other side of the world. No. As long as your actions makes you what you are. Okay, I don't know what the fuck he said there. But anyway, I don't believe him. I think he's talking out of his ass. I think he was um I think he was the one that probably set the pace in terms of the rude exchange. That girl probably matched his energy because he was talking spicy to her. Um he already had a bit of a scowl and attitude to him. And I just think the fact that he that he went to push her in her face instead of just being, Hey, please man, please don't do this, don't do this. Let's just talk about like whatever holding his hands up and blocking is one thing but he was already trying to push her back really hard he's pushed his hand in her face which then reacted with a slap and then he started choking her it was crazy he should have ended it right they should have just walked away the moment he pushed her he overset the mark the moment she slapped him back she overset the mark but he should have as a man walked away from that situation and just said okay fine you're banned from this store don't ever come back again and just let her walk out with her shit it's an l you catch it another day and it is what it is if you wanted to report it later, you could report it. But strangling her, like, what, what, what is that going to prove? Like, it's absolutely idiotic thing to do. And if anything, it's more representation, or it's more representative of what he probably does behind closed doors than anything else, in my personal opinion. So fuck that guy, fuck that shop. And I hope people see that as a sign that, forget the race thing, that's not really important. Maybe there is an undercurrent of that occurring. I just think in general, just go where people treat you well. If you're not getting treated well and there's other options, go to the other options. If there's no other options, you have to just be an adult and suck it up and let the person, you know, essentially mug you every time you go in the store. But if you don't get treated well, if you don't get respected, 
um if you just have a bad experience it's no need just going back there just you know to get yourself pissed off just go and shop somewhere else give your money to someone else who actually um will be thankful for your service will treat you with respect and will make the experience comfortable and enjoyable whatever it may be that's the way forward to go with these type of things um don't be like united fans right united fans want to protest about the glazers and we do fucking sittings we don't boycott we don't boycott the fucking stadium we don't not renew our season tickets we don't not buy from the fucking mega store we still buy from the mega store we still attend games we sit in on games and don't leave and when we're meant to leave and we think we're protesting and actually sticking it to the glades and really if you actually boycott properly like how the blackball fans did when their owner was accused of doing all that madness right that's how you actually enact change actually voting with your feet but we don't do that enough um, and I hope we do now going forward and seeing that as a kind of resolution because forget the race thing that guy just seems like a cunt like you shouldn't be giving your money to cunts personally in my personal opinion that's what I think is in that, in that regard um, but hey what do I know what do I know so um that has been the action zing show episode number 705 thanks so much for tuning in been a pleasure to have your company as per usual if you're the first time checking out the show please make sure that you smash the like button down below if you're watching it via the youtube if you're listening via the podcast app i do appreciate every single one of you please make sure you leave me a five star review on spotify and apple i've seen a few big ones on spotify those numbers are going up but i've not got enough on the apple please do me a favor if you can and you have some time leave me a little five star review on the apple podcast i'd be greatly appreciated and then of course if you want links to me and what i do and socials and stuff you can find that in the descriptions but for now i'll leave you if you're listening to the audio podcast you hear my tune today playing underneath me as i leave out and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe everybody peace <laughs>